Welcome to the Coin Stories podcast, where we get to explore the future of money, business, technology, and Bitcoin's revolutionary promise to boost economic prosperity around the world and mend our broken financial system. I'm Natalie Brunel, and I'm here to learn with you. This podcast is for educational and entertainment purposes only. None of the discussions should constitute as official investment advice, and you should always do your own research. Please make sure to subscribe to the show so you don't miss out on any new episodes. This podcast is made possible through partnerships with companies I trust, and I'm very picky about who I choose to partner with, so I hope you take the time to listen to the ad reads throughout the show. Thanks for joining me, and if you like this type of content and want to see more of it, make sure to hit that like button. All right, it's time for the show. Welcome back to the show. Joining me this week is Melody Wright. She is a strategist, author, and technologist. I heard about her for the first time from Danielle DiMartino Booth, who also follows all of her amazing research on the housing market and what's happening underneath uh, the surface of our economy. So Melody, thank you so much for joining me. Thank you so much for having me. It's a pleasure to be here. Well, before we dive into all of your research, I just want to hear a little bit more about you and how you got into this. Because um, one thing that you you say on your uh, Twitter or X page is that you're a great financial crisis survivor. And I can relate to that. I am too. So just tell me a little bit about your, your background and how you got into this work. Yeah. So I fell into this by accident, which is what most people do when they get into the housing or mortgage space. And so, um, you know, kind of sh showed up as a project analyst back in 2006. Uh, but it was at a really, of course, that year should tell you it was an interesting time. I was at a top five originator and servicer uh, who had just we were finalizing a purchase with Cerberus, which was private equity and they needed to learn all about the mortgage business and so i became their girl friday going across the company kind of getting reports and with them i started understanding the business and and kind of from there uh so i was in kind of the finance side of it uh got sort of transitioned to strategy when we got into a lot of trouble like uh the AG settlement, the consent orders, these are things from back then. That's when all of the banks sort of got in trouble for, you know, perhaps not following the procedures for foreclosure or default, things like that. So I helped out with that. And then our company, we, we held on for a long time, but we ultimately kind of had to file bankruptcy, which I helped manage as well. Wow. <laughs> um, it was a very big bankruptcy at the time. Um, we were the first company to go into bank bankruptcy and still originate loans. That's the first time it had ever happened. A lot of interest in our auction. Um, but once I was done with that, they needed help with the default uh, crisis. They needed someone to help manage that uh, operational unit. So I went in and spent the next year just really traveling all across the country to, um, to, to help manage that crisis as there were just foreclosures across the country, you know, stuck, et cetera. Wow. Well, so how did that whole experience, the great financial crisis, how did it shape you? Um, you know, I think that it, uh, well, it, it took a lot of time from my life, I would say. <laughs> and it, you know, we were in the office, uh, you know, in 2009, 185 days straight. And so, we ultimately, um, you know, it shaped me in the sense of I believed and, and, and so did everybody that I was working with at the time that we were fixing things. So this would never happen again, you know, that we would never have borrowers and other people impacted in this way. And we would make sure that we were doing everything correctly. And, you know, that's what we believed at my company. And so, you know, it burned me so badly um, that I was pretty much very adamant kind of in the companies that I went to after that, like, we have to do things right because otherwise we're going to end up here again. And I can tell you that I, I never believed that we would, but I would say that, you know, it was very, <laughs> in a way, traumatic <laughs> um, just because it was just all encompassing when you were in these places that got tarp money, trying to survive, doing strategic alternatives. And so I learned a lot of lessons, um, but I don't think we did. <laughs> Well, you know. let me, let, as far as lessons go, let me ask you, what is the biggest lesson about what got us to that crisis that you learned? And what's the biggest lesson about our government's reaction to the crisis? So 
So if you had asked me, you know, 2013, I would probably have a different answer. Um, But what I have learned is that uh, people were too focused on subprime and didn't really understand how the crisis unfolded and, and what really was the crisis, because it wasn't just one thing. And I think a lot of people think subprime started, you know, the GFC. Well, that was a liquidity crisis. That was a dollar shortage. And so that's very different from then what happened, you know, kind of the peak of default didn't happen till, you know, later 2010, 11, 12. And this is when your prime borrowers kind of were impacted. So a lot of people just say, no, it was just subprime. It was subprime was the kindling. And so what I learned is that narrative drives everything. You know, that's what I learned (laughs) because we were all very, um, since that time, I've read a lot of studies. I've thought about even my own experience and realized that we got it wrong, what happened. And that's why we couldn't see what was coming, what's coming this time around, because it really, it was also an affordability crisis because of increased home values, which was then exacerbated by, you know, what happened with kind of the credit event. But what did I learn about our government response? Um, You know, it wasn't productive. (laughs) It didn't work. You know, you had Rudy on, uh, you know, he and I talk about, you know, I I personally believe, I don't think TARP made anybody better. It made it, it, you know, my parent company starved our servicing unit, which is the back end of of mortgage. And that is why we did, we, those mistakes were made. And so that money got, funneled into marketing and other types of things versus actually coming into the organization and making us better. And so to me, as much as it would have been painful, I believe that we should never have um, sort of saved some of these these entities. entities. We should have let it, you know, creative destruction happen. and, And we should have gone ahead and just gone through the pain at the time. Right. Let the fever do its work so that we can actually rebuild on stronger footing. I know Rudy Rudy Havenstein is one of the people that always talks online about how quantitative easing and this massive stimulus and injection of, of money printing into the economy has created such asset inflation and really exacerbated the wealth concentration. And now people store most of their savings in their house. But for future generations trying to come up, they can't afford to get into that housing market once you could afford it on one income and now multiple incomes don't suffice and people just feel like they're you know in this rat race um so let's talk about the housing market right now because one thing i mentioned to you before we started recording is When you look at macro analysis online right now, I mean, it's like a a tale of two two different stories. One is, hey, we're going to have a soft landing or no landing. Everything's great. We're we're chugging along really strong in the economy. And the other is we're going to have a worse crisis than 0809. We're going to have possibly a, a worse situation than the 1930s, a second Great Depression. So talk to us about what you're really seeing on the ground, because you're traveling to so many of these markets and doing that on the ground research. Yeah. So, you know, what I what I see coming and I talk a lot about the path, not prediction. And, you know, I'm, I, I wish I could be the one that said it's all going to be great. Um, but, you know, we're kind of in the middle is what I call it, <laughs> uh, the messy, muddy middle, because I can remember very clearly back in 2007, eight and nine, we also believe things were turning around. I remember sitting in a ballroom with our president, gave us all clickers and said, you know, when do you think the housing market is going to turn around? It was like nine or 10. I'm like, uh, no, (laughs) it's going to take longer. But everyone was looking at the same things they're looking at today. They were looking at these, you know, very small moves in the case shiller, which is what tracks home price appreciation, but does it on a delayed basis. You know, they were looking at the same data permits, you know, applications. The problem is when you look at all that stuff in aggregate, you miss so much of the story. I mean, it, it just, and it, you know, even if they look at what they call the MSA level, which is kind of the metro, I think you miss the early moves by looking at that aggregate data. And something I learned being in the mortgage business is that you have to understand these local cities to some degree. Now, we're not superhuman, we can't understand them all, but what I'm really trying to do is kind of give them more bottoms up. And so what I'm seeing, based on all of that and looking at alternative sets of data, more real time, especially around the short-term rental, long-term rental, things like that is 
and and the new builds, which are, are the most concerning to me uh, in terms of just the amount of inventory I've seen out there is it, it's hard to describe in words, especially when everyone is screaming, we have no inventory. And so, you know, what I can tell you is that you have all this inventory that's going to hit the market because of affordability. So I think our path is not not a great one. <laughs> okay, let's dig into a little bit of that because since 2020, since the pandemic, um, home affordability has just decreased by by so much. I mean, because of the interest rates, uh, monthly payments are up, um, but then also, you know, a lot of money pooled into this asset class, so the home prices are, are inflated as well. Um, so, so what are you seeing in terms of just inventory across the country? Because I know this is it's it's sort of different depending on the area, right? A lot of people, for example, like myself, left California, but one thing that I'm finding is here, I live in Missouri now, here I'm starting to try to, you know, look at real estate and houses go in a day, uh, no inspection, contingency, all cash offers. So it's super confusing because on the one hand, I'm like, we're about to hit a recession. Things are slowing down and houses are unaffordable. On the other, I try to, you know, look at some real estate personally and they're flying off the shelf like hotcakes. Yeah. And, and I think that has a lot to do with the small mom and pop investors that are kind of coming in at the end. Uh, and so it, it's still very shocking and surprising to me that, you know, we've seen articles, we've, a lot of us have been talking about the short term rental craze being bust for some time, but a lot of people haven't gotten that memo and they talk to their friends and, um, or they talked to their friends six months ago and, you know, Everybody thinks this is a way to make passive income. And I can tell you, I still oversee books and a lot of these are still investment loans. And so there's way to, um, for the all cash sales you're seeing, people will go out and get other types of leverage. They'll either cash out of a bigger property. Um, they'll take out a loan on their crypto or their, or their equity assets and they'll show up with all cash. And, and one thing they'll do is that coming soon, what that really is a way to do is to put the listing out there. And what you don't realize is they're marketing that to a select group of people behind the scenes. And that's why they, that's how they do an end run around like National Association of Realtors, the MLS. And so that's why you're seeing it was sold because they've been actually marketing that for 21 days and talking to people before you even get the opportunity. And they do that as a way to get an edge in the market. And so there's the macro piece of, the investors, the small mom and pop, because the institutionals have pulled pull, pull back. And then sort of like your realtors, your brokers, these people on the ground that are doing their best to, to make every dollar they can, if that makes sense. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, that literally happened to me. There was a, a listing and it was coming soon, coming right. soon. And the second that it was actually available to the general public like myself, it was already gone with an all cash offer. And I was like, wow. Um, but OK, so you said we're kind of muddying through and you know how bad it got yeah. in, in the great financial crisis. So what are we barreling toward right now? It's time for a quick break to hear these messages from my partners. First up, Bitcoin Amsterdam, the biggest Bitcoin conference in Europe, is just around the corner. The second annual event will be held October 12th and 13th and bring together speakers from around the world, including the one and only Edward Snowden, Stella Assange, Balaji, Eva Vlardingerbroek, and so many more. Get your tickets with a 10% discount using code HODL. And don't forget to get your early bird pass to Bitcoin Nashville 2024. You're going to get the best price right now. And again, use code HODL for that discount. I'll see you there. Next up, Fold. Fold is the best Bitcoin rewards debit card and shopping app in the world. You can earn Bitcoin on everything you purchase from Amazon to groceries to your Bitcoin conference ticket with Fold's Bitcoin cashback debit card. And you can play to win free Satoshis or even a whole Bitcoin by spinning the rewards wheel. This is a great app to get someone totally new into Bitcoin. And it's way better than earning reward airline miles and hotel points. Head to foldapp.com slash Natalie and you'll get 10,000 Satoshis when you sign up for Spin or Spin Plus and spend at least $20 on the card. All right, back to the show. So we've got a lot of oncoming trains uh, that are all headed to the same destination. And so the timing's a bit tricky, but on the one hand, you have an affordability crisis, um, especially for these people that bought in 21 and 22 um, you know, increasing property taxes and insurance are, are, I've seen escrow notices go out where, 
you know, they basically say, let me look at your insurance and tax for the next year. Now we've got to increase your payment. I've actually seen notices go out that are two times that original payment. I mean, and, and you know, and that's happening on investment properties. And so and it's also ha happening to your regular folks. So they themselves don't realize, didn't realize when they were getting that loan, really what was coming in terms of these added expenses. And then when a lot of them do things like waive the inspection, they, they could have replacing, you know, an air conditioner, roof issues, all kinds of things. So you've got affordability just crashing down on these folks. And so I'm very different where a lot of people think that, okay, we have to have some kind of either a credit event or we have to see a lot more unemployment. I'm seeing already, like even if we didn't have those things, you're gonna see default. Now, there's a lot of government programs out there as there was during COVID and they'll catch some of it, but there's just been so much government lending since 2009. We've actually doubled the amount of mortgage-backed securities in our government, um, kind of taking the place almost of, of those uh, private loans that caused the issue last time. And so those folks themselves, um, are they going to struggle and, and, and probably not be able to even get a workout that's going to work out for them? So that, that's what the affordability is a big problem. And then, you know, with home prices where they are today, uh, I'm of the belief that rates are important, but home prices are really what's crushing affordability. You know, there's just not going to be much, um, there's nothing rosy in the future. And, you know, I think everybody thought we were going to get rich. And I think it's slowly sinking in that those wage increases aren't going to come. But if they come, if they do, it's usually going to be through a battle that's going to take time. So it won't be overnight. Um, and then they're not the pay increases, too, that could really make this a different kind of uh, mortgage market in the foreseeable future. Everybody's right. banking on rates going down. Yep. Well, it was recently reported that the average or the median income has actually gone down, especially in terms of real purchasing power because mm -hmm. of inflation. And with those mortgage-backed right. securities, we've kicked the can up to the sovereign level. And so we are so much more leveraged in general. <laughs> I, I think this week it came yes. out, $33 trillion of debt the U.S. has. Um, well, okay. So first, I have a question about just inventory in general coming online, because one thing that you do talk a lot about is sort of that Airbnb and, and like all the vacancies that happen, because as you mentioned, people thought, oh, if I, you know, take on take out some debt at low interest rates, I can purchase a property and rent it out and it's passive income. And here I am. I'm going to take a vacation with all that passive income. But a lot of those um, they're, they're, they're basically there's too much supply and not enough demand. So those might be coming on the market. It, but aren't those mostly, let's say, apartments, condos, or multifamily homes as opposed to a single family home that you might want to, you know, raise your kids in and actually stay in for the length of a long mortgage? Yeah, so it depends, but not mostly. So um, there's a lot of different great data sources out there, but you can look on average about 75 to 80 percent in aggregate, some much higher are actually whole homes. And the other thing I was just talking to a follower about is that, so when you go and search something on Airbnb's site, for instance, um, they're going to say a thousand plus listings in this area. So when you go search Austin, it'll say a thousand plus. It won't tell you how many. It won't tell you that there's 14,387 in Austin, nor oh do they God. tell you explicitly that when you search in Austin, you're only going to get 300 shown at any time. So what this is a big kept secret of how many of these short term rentals are in these locations, because everybody went crazy thinking that COVID trend was going to persist. And then there's the underlying technology that people were using to kind of justify, uh, you know, the mortgages on these or even justify purchasing it with an all cash would say something like you're going to make on average six hundred dollars, you know, a day. Uh, and you'll be occupied 55% of the year. None of that was accurate. That wasn't like looking at good comps. That was looking at maybe the, you know, the travel boom year when we couldn't really go overseas. And yeah. so everyone, I mean, I, I track over 70 cities and, and each one of them, if you look at these, you're just, you, it just blows your mind because you have, we also have hotels in most of those cities. Yeah. So that's, that's, I think that people underestimate 
how much of this is out there. And they, they think, okay, maybe it's multifamily. Like in New York, 26,000 are listed, right? That's not all, you know, single dwelling, but there are a lot. And, and so, you know, again, around that 60% range, I think this is going to come. And even if a little bit of it comes, then that's enough. And then you layer on the built for rent, which was people building for long-term rental because they wanted to get in on what Wall Street had done at the end of the last crisis in 2012, 2013 and up. And that is a lot of the inventory I've seen out there, just whole subdivisions built for rent, while at the same time you have multifamily going gangbusters, um, more than we've ever had since the 70s, and we don't have the demographics to support it. So those are two big pieces. And I do believe you're, you know, Wall Street is kind of backing out, you know, they've become net sellers of built for rent. And so, you know, I, I think this is all going to start, it's already started in many cities. This is what when you look at the aggregate numbers, even though those, those are ticking up finally, <laughs> they're finally ticking up, um, but you get lost because you're not looking at these specific markets. And so you're not seeing those early trends. And then you, you know, on top of that, if seniors can sell their existing homes that they've had for second or third homes, mm -hmm. and they can make 5% or more on their cash, people are going to start to do these things and, and you can already see it happening. And that's why I think a lot of people just, they're looking backward and they're saying, we only, you know, we didn't build enough, Well, but we've got to look forward. What's our population and, and who's going to be able to afford it? And what about these boomers that are retiring and won't be sustaining their, these homes anymore and their kids won't be able to either because they simply won't be able to afford it? Well, right. I mean, it's really <laughs> shocking to see how how high some of the monthly payments are and how, you know, just a couple percentage points makes a massive, massive difference. And obviously, yeah. Federal uh, Reserve Chair Jerome Powell, he is so adamant on, on remaining higher for longer. I'm actually surprised by how much our system has been able to sustain the higher interest rates um, and the speed at which which he yeah. increased them. And, and, you know, they've kind of, you know, plastered over some of the leaks leaks and and saved the day when it came to that uh the banking crisis a couple of months right. ago or earlier in the year but i do feel like everyone's sort of expecting eventually some sort of an event a credit event and they're gonna have to come in lower the interest rates and print again first of yeah. all do you agree with that and second of all wouldn't that mean that hey interest rates are going to come down, money's going to be pumped in, houses are going to get even more um, expensive in terms of the price, but cheaper in terms of your monthly payment. So more money is going to flow into this space and we'll avoid a housing market crash. Right. So I, I think the banking crisis is still happening. I think that, you know, the news pretty much tries to make us think or, you know, it's all taken care of. But in reality, you know, I follow the euro dollar markets. I follow the behind the scenes and and you can see the dollar shortage, you can see the credit crunch having its impact and, and, and they're being very quiet about it. But like, you know, an article came out this week about the FDIC not being able to sell some of these assets. It is only a matter of time. It's about contagion. And last time around, we were actually the virus because of that private equity purchase, we had to take write downs um, and we took them way before other people because they wanted that purchase price adjustment. And so we led the way and it takes one, one, <laughs> you know, and I, I honestly believe these assets that aren't being sold by the FDIC, which are very similar to other assets sitting on other banks books, that this is the, can, the, the fire starting. And so that crisis isn't over. It's just that people have stopped talking about it for the most part. But to your second point about, you know, well, he, it's gonna, there's going to be a credit event. Well, what happens during a credit event? I think this is what everybody forgets. You know, credit event, Lehman falls over, you know, Bear falls over. Well, what about all those jobs, you know? And then what does that do about all of those people that are, you know, it's, it's a system. And so when it, when one falls, it's because something's wrong in the system. And so if we have a credit event, we will have layoffs. We will have, you know, people who have lost a lot. And thus, you know, lowering rates isn't going to help anybody except for those that kind of like survive that, you know. And honestly, everybody talks about this demand. Well, it's demand at a certain price point mm -hmm. a, and a certain payment, which includes that those rates. And we're not we're not anywhere close to that. And so lowering rates is not going to help. And then 
layer on top that we're probably going to be in pretty dire straits if that's what's happening. Melody, can you talk to me about inflated credit scores and, you know, what you're seeing sort of under the surface about whether people who got mortgages can actually still afford them coming coming down the pipe? Yeah. So um, we're actually seeing early delinquency in our uh, FHA and VA population, um, as well as it's just now starting in our prime Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac population. And I think that that ultimately has something to do with the fact that credit scores were inflated uh, during COVID. One, because uh, medical debt was not treated the same way as it was during the GFC, a lot of leniency there. And then also on the, uh, the student loans, the way that that was calculated was off of a much lower payment amount. Um, so let's say it was like a $250 when in reality your payment was a thousand. And so it just made the credit profile of these borrowers, borrowers seem better, not looking at the affordability of really could they be able to pay back. Wow. Okay. And so you, you can kind of see that if you're originating a loan, you punch in these numbers and then the loan gets approved, right? If there's a certain right. ratio, That's but right. those ratios are dramatically changing. They've changed. Definitely. Um, and I think this is something people talk about all the time. Like you cannot read an article about 2008 without what I call credit quality gospel singing, <laughs> which is talking about how cr everybody credit quality is so much better. Well, firstly, like let's look at our government, um, our government loans, FHA, VA, those credit scores are in the 600s. I mean, you know, those uh, loan to values are very high, you know, with only 3% down. I mean, and even the GSCs were doing programs last year of 1% with certain homeowner assistance. So, you know, we truly were not looking at an ability to repay in a normalized market. And so I'm seeing where I didn't expect to see deteriorating uh, credit quality this fast. I actually believe things would happen in the super prime first. And we are seeing that, you know, that's where you're seeing the investors walk away already. Um, but I'm seeing degradation in, in borrowers with mortgages much faster than I anticipated because they can't repay, especially with those increased uh, insurance and property tax costs. Well, right. And the COVID programs are ending. People have to right. start to pay back their student loans again. Right. Um, but if, if they can't, won't the government just rush in and, and help them or no? They, they absolutely will. Uh, they'll, they'll try. But when you go back to the GFC and you look at those programs, uh, they weren't successful for many, as you know, <laughs> right? Like they they yeah. weren't, people couldn't repay no matter what. And they're very strict about, you know, these modification programs. And if you can't qualify, you can't qualify. A lot of times the, the, the servicer you're working with has no choice in that. That's a Fannie Mae, Freddie Mac, FHA. So yes, there will be a ton of government programs. But with my experience in default, I can tell you there's just a, a, a good majority that just they can't even um, qualify for those either. They can't make those payments because the affordability is just getting crushed. And when you double your payment, I mean, that's that's a that's a big expense that you weren't expecting. So. It's time for another quick break to hear these messages from my partners. Next up, CoinKite, which offers everything you need to safely take custody of your Bitcoin. CoinKite produces the cold card wallet, which is the cold storage device I use for safekeeping my Bitcoin. You can verify the source code. It's ultra secure and it's easy to use, even if you're a beginner. Head to their website in my show notes to find all of their custody products, cold cards in different colors, seed phrase plates, tap signers, block clocks, and more. And you'll get a 5% discount with my link. Become your own bank with Bitcoin and CoinKite. Next up, I want to share with you about CrowdHealth. Health insurance costs are sky high today, and you send your money every month to a fiat corporation only to never see that money again, even if you don't get sick. But if you do need care, you end up having to pay even more out of pocket. But luckily, there's an alternative, and it's all about community. CrowdHealth brings together Bitcoiners who crowdfund each other's healthcare. So you no longer have to pay fiat health insurance companies. You get to actually help other Bitcoiners, and they help you in return. So how it works is when you need a doctor or hospital visit, CrowdHealth negotiates down the medical bill lower than what insurance would be, and the community helps you cover the costs. You get to save the money you would have sent to an insurance company, and hey, why not put it into Bitcoin? 
To sign up, head to joincrowdhealth.com slash Natalie. All right, next up, I'm excited to share that I am an advisor for the Orange Pill app. If you haven't downloaded this app yet, then you're missing out on connecting with Bitcoiners in your area. The Orange Pill app is focused on building the social layer for Bitcoin and helping create opportunities for in-person connections and community building. You create a profile and you'll see lots of familiar faces. And then you can search for Bitcoiners and Bitcoin events based on your location. Come join us and use the referral link in my show notes to start connecting today. Well, you posted an article uh, just this week about how people right now, especially those who purchased in the last couple of years, they are struggling to make payments. I mean, the reality is, despite what economist Paul Krugman says, inflation has really hit people. Um, Your income is not keeping pace with the cost of everything around you. And so people are really, you know, suffering. And those that got their house on a a really low interest rate, they're kind of locked in right now. Um, But do you essentially see something ahead of us in the next year or two that is worse than 0809 and and the experience that some of maybe my viewers and listeners had during the great financial crisis because my family we we lost our home we were one of the 10 million american families who went bankrupt lost their home um and of course the big the big banks got bailed out but not the american families right and it, it's generational too, right? So like I, my family, we lost our home <laughs> as well oh. back in, you know, the late seventies, early eighties. So, you know, you know, I, what I've started to realize is this is kind of what happens is you get whole groups of people kind of wiped out, you know, by these events. And so is it going, you know, I feel like people get lost in the let's compare to, to 08 and everybody just starts, no, it's not going to be the same. Like to me, it's it's going to be if it plays out which at this point i don't know how it doesn't i think it is going to be somewhat worse because we're actually i i I believe based on how much debt we have and things like that that wall street won't be able to come in and save it now the government likely will they'll probably get there first but remember they were a big part of it last time fanny and freddie were the ones that pushed those cells out to wall street and so I think you're probably going to get government really involved. Um, I think this ev- suddenly everybody's going to wake up to all this inventory and, you know, you're going to have write downs all over the place. Um, and so I, I do, I do think that it could be worse. And I, you know, I think it could take some time to play out unless we have an exogenous or a credit event. And then I think things could speed up, but, I think you're looking at a, you know, a three to five year downturn if, if things go the, you know, like just the path that we're on right now. Okay. So given what you just said, when would a good time to buy be? And I'm asking this for a very personal reason, because as much as I love my Bitcoin, I can't live in a Bitcoin. And my dream right. ever since my family <laughs> came here and what I really see is, you know, accomplishing the American dream is is owning a house um i've you know i've never lived in a house where i didn't have neighbors above me below me to the side ever like i've always dreamt of having a single family house and every year it feels less and less within reach even though i'm working hard and maybe i'm you know achieving more in my career it always feels like it's like one step further out of reach um and maybe people can relate to that so when do you buy do you wait for that sort of downturn um or do you go now because you can refinance? What, what, what are people supposed to do? Yeah, so it, it's it's horrible. And I wish that, you know, I wish I had a better answer. Um, but I, 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 unless you have to, and there, you know, there's death, divorce, default, and the DOD uh, for reasons people will have to move that are not their choice, okay? Um, and so those people, you know, I say, if you have to make a choice, please reach out to someone like myself and, and we can talk through it because there's better choices to make. But, you know, I, I don't think it's realistic to tell someone you're going to have to wait five years. Um, but I think you're going to have to, if you're in it for the long term, you're going to have to understand the risk. And, and you know, there's trade-offs, right? I think you can make better decisions. And I hope after this, I can actually give you some tools where you might be able to get ahead of those people that are marketing in the background and then negotiate. You know, um, so I wish my answer was that, you know, wait a year and and everything's going to be fine. I think it's a little more complicated than that, but I think there are markets um, where you'll be able to get an edge in within the next, you know, the next year or so. 
Um, but it is, it just don't do it blind and don't go in listening to the people that are going to make money when they sell you that house because their interest is in their commission and not, you know, that, that, that puts food on their table. Let's put it that way. Right. Um, so yeah. So, and I, I know that's not a great answer, but I think that, you know, just talk to somebody like me or someone and there will be, it, it will depend on your market and there will be better choices to make probably within the next six to nine months, honestly. Okay. That's really good advice. Um, before we start to wrap up, I wanted to ask you about uh, HOAs because there's the you know mortgage payment and there's your principal, your you know your insurance, all that. But wow, sometimes I look at homes and I go, how how is the HOA this high? I mean, have you done any research in this space and how are people affording HOAs? Uh, so they're not, and it's just one more thing that they don't even think about. And then the fact that you know. Um, I always caution people to read their CCNRs and <laughs> what those are, are the covenants of the HOA, because if they can do something like raise your, you know, your fee without any kind of, you know, process, they just come to you. You don't want that. And it, it is a very critical part of your decision. Um, I don't know how people afford it, but usually they, they're not even thinking about it. Um, and they're not right. thinking that it's going to get raised. Um, and, and the HOAs during a crisis in the super lien states, they will take priority lien, meaning they will foreclose that house faster than uh, your bank or your non-bank. It's wild. I, I mean, I had no idea, especially when I was wild. young, thinking about, you know, someday having a house. I never thought about these extra fees. Uh, and I'm sure some That's homeowners associations are great, but I got to be honest, I've served as a reporter for many years. There were some issues with some of them and yeah. it's like a, a local small government. So obviously there's corruption yeah. and there's, you know, there's mm -hmm. politics um, at, at local levels. So, uh, so tell me in the markets that you research. Yeah, exactly. Um, in the market that you focus on, tell me the one that's maybe the best, uh, the one with the least amount of problems or the most opportunity for people who are looking for a home or, or are current homeowners, and the one with sort of the most problems under the surface where you're like, oh my gosh, something's about to crack. Yeah, so right now the Midwest is probably your best bet in terms of um, getting affordability and, and not these you know double-digit price uh, appreciation, but that's quickly changing. You know, like somewhere like Cleveland, places like that. But then you also have to think about, okay, does it have the school system I want? Does it have, you know, all these different things? But from affordability, um, places like Cleveland, um, places like Columbus and Ohio are kind of really the last place. And, and honestly, Missouri, you know, listening to you say this to me, it's telling me the investors are probably there because it is one of the last <laughs> markets. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, but what's going to, every one of these markets, people move to, they buy, and then it becomes unaffordable. So it's just the same, you know, loop. And then I think any of these Sunbelt cities, uh, reach out and talk to me. Do not, do not purchase in Nashville, uh, Austin, Charlotte, Phoenix, um, you know, and especially down here in Orlando without really doing your homework. And and don't, again, not what they're telling you, not the pamphlet they give you, not the brochure. You really need to look at the demographics. You, you need to look at what the future may hold for that area, what, what other investor activity maybe is going on. So you really need to be knowledgeable about that market in a way that, you, that most people aren't used to being. Well, you named a lot of places where during the pandemic, everyone was flooding to those areas, the Nashvilles, yeah. the Austins, the uh, Florida, Miami, right. Orlando, especially from where I used to live, California. Um, okay, so to wrap up, I really want to get yeah. your thoughts on, on Bitcoin. Because uh, one thing that we talk about on the show is that Bitcoin is this form of, you know, digital property. And so many people, like I mentioned earlier, store their whole wealth in their house. But there are maintenance costs, right? And there are all these other hurdles when it comes to that as an investment class that maybe Bitcoin doesn't have. But are you a Bitcoiner? What do you think about right. Bitcoin? Do you think Bitcoin will help people buy their dream house someday? 
Yeah. So I think I was, um, I've, I've changed my thought around it over time. You know, at first it looked just speculative when it was going crazy. I kind of started studying my macro, you know, in late 2021. So I was like, what is this? And I'm not a gambler by nature. So I was just like, no, like this doesn't make sense to me. But then as I got more into macro, as I understood, you know, kind of our monetary system, you know, the injustice that we all see that's happening based on quantitative easing, this asset price, you know, acceleration. I, I, I definitely see the efficacy. I, I see that this is important and I think it's important for people to push an alternative. You know, I have to be honest that I'm a little nervous about, you know, central bank digital currency and, and, and our financial repression and, and people coming in. But, but on the whole, I, you know, to me, this is something, this is an, it, it, the technology I like, number one. And then number two, I like it as an alternative, um, you know, and a way to kind of protect yourself uh, for what's to come. I'm a big believer in diversification, no matter what. <laughs> uh, but, you know, I've definitely changed my thoughts on this and, and actually really agree with a lot of the principle behind Bitcoin. Well, that is so great to hear. And uh, I hope we get a chance to chat with you more because one thing is if, if you made the right decision about Bitcoin years ago, houses have been getting cheaper for you in, in terms of Bitcoin, which is really nice. Uh, there's, a, there's a mentor that I have in the space, Jeff Booth, an author. He says that it will oh, yeah. demonetize real estate and bring it down to more of its utility value. You know, these houses, like you're supposed to live in them. They're supposed to be valued based on the right. utility that you get out of them. And it's just, it's it's right. so funny when I see these posts, right, where the house was purchased for like, I don't know, 60, 70,000 in the 70s. And now it's a couple million and it's like falling apart. But, you know, someone's got cash to, to, to purchase that property and redo it. And it's just wild what we've done to the market. It's wild what yeah. asset inflation has done to our country. Um, Most of okay. it's leveraged. Yeah. So exactly, exactly. All right, Melody, yeah. this has been so great. Any final thoughts and how can people find and support your work? Uh, final thoughts again, you know, you're a lot of times you're gonna have to make a decision. So just, you know, reach out to someone like me and and be thoughtful about that decision. Please don't go into it. Please don't waive a property inspection, et cetera. <laughs> and hold on, because I do believe we're going to have a, a correction. And I do believe that price will meet affordability. But you can reach out to me on Twitter at M3 underscore Melody, M-E-L-O-D-Y, uh, on LinkedIn at Melody Wright, W-R-I-G-H-T, on uh, Substack at M3 Melody Substack, and then on YouTube, M3 Melody YouTube. So a bunch oh, of different your locations. Great. Yeah, oh, your you stuff's so much. great. Melody, thank you so much for, for the work that you do. Really grateful that I found you thanks to Danielle. So shout out to her as well. Um, yeah. Melody, I hope you come back Very on soon. Thank you. I've enjoyed it. Thank you so much for having me. Thank you. Thank you so much for checking out the video version of my show. If you want to see more content like this, make sure you're subscribed to the channel and hit like on the video. And please reach out with feedback or guest suggestions. My email is natalie at talkingbitcoin.com. I'll see you next time.